day, everyone. Uh, welcome to QCAM webinar number 44. My name is Kwon Yu Liu. I'm a staff scientist here at QCAM Pleasanton. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Maximilian Menger. He was speaking to us for PySci, uh, a framework for database accelerated direct dynamics. Max received his PhD in theoretical chemistry in 2019. During his uh, grad studies, uh, he worked with Professor Benedetta Minucci and Professor Leticia Gonzalez on multi-scale approaches for light harvesting systems. Uh, Max work led to uh, several high quality papers as well as the honor added to his PhD degree. Since June 2019, he has been working with Professor Sharon Faraji at University of Groningen on the development of efficient approaches to study the photo-induced non-adiabatic dynamics of large systems with explicit inclusion of the complex environment. Max has contributed to various computational chemistry softwares for example, QCAM, Shark, Theodore, and he is also the MEMP developer of PySurf. If you watch the uh, video from YouTube, you can also post your, post your questions out on our um, uh, forum. I already created a topic for it. Feel free to submit the questions here. Um, um, Without further ado, I'll turn this over to Max. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Th thanks a lot for the nice introduction and uh, having me here to share a bit uh, what uh, we worked here in the group of Shane Farage in the um, in the last three periods. We we came to, we named the framework for database accelerate direct dynamics by the show you in a bit that you can use it for much more if you want to. <laughs> but uh, before I actually start with the um, framework, I just uh, start with a bit what I call quantum, uh, so, so what we do in quantum chemistry on a daily basis. Nice. Like, uh, of course, the, the main approximation that every, basically all our work is uh, based on is uh, kind of the von Oppenheimer approximation separating nuclear and electronic degrees of freedom and therefore kind of um, uh, nuclear structures like here this benzene molecule um, tend to make uh, um, make actually sense in the description of the system right so we can compute electronic properties at give a nuclear uh, structure or uh, positions. And then we can kind of um, discuss properties in terms of structure and energy relationships. And that enables us that we can also, of course, compute some energy. So here, in this, I stay with benzene, and you kind of can, for a given structure, you can formula it is uh, you can compute its uh, occupied and virtual orbitals and discuss kind of electronic states and thing but of course if you um, can compute electronic properties at a given nuclear position it raises basically the question in, in how do you select those structures right and all methods that we typically use can be roughly um uh separated in what i call here very loosely dependent structure methods and independent so dependent structure method basically is a propagation or an optimization where your new geometry that you use um kind of depends on the prop uh, properties uh, of the points before like if you do an optimization typically if uh, you start at a given position and then in the easiest case you follow the gradient of 
uh, the, uh, the system to find transition points or minima on the potential energy surface. But therefore, you're, you're basically using the information of the points before to, um, to derive the new structure. And on the other hand, you're kind of like independent structure method where you can uh, where, where the structures do not depend on each other and examples of like if I do a weakness sampling or I take snapshots from a classical molecular dynamics run to compute for example an absorption spectrum of the system then I can run all my electronic structure calculations independently in a trivial parallel manner and uh, I can collect the results and yeah. So, so roughly speaking, quant uh, all of um, basic, uh, the, the majority of quantum chemistry can be divided in these three things. So the electronic structure is at core and then we have some ways to smart select structures and compute from there the properties that we want. And if we take our uh, favorite electronic structure code, for example, here, I select QCAM, and uh, you have several abstractions for these things. So we have a multitude of methods to compute electronic properties at a given, um, uh, for a given nuclear position. Uh, so like for the ground state, for example, you have for so SCF based method like hot fog DFT or some correlate systems like murder plus uh, perturbation theory or up to cup cluster schemes. And then for excited side, you have, uh, uh, you have configuration interaction type methods, you have linear response, time dependent density, functional theory. You have uh, um, adiabatic diagrammatic construction methods or equation of motion coupled cluster. And this is just the selection of these things available within QCAM, right? And then additionally, we have algorithms like geometry optimizers to really uh, find um, critic points on the potential energy surface like conical intersections or minima transition points and so on. And on top of that, we also have included standalone molecular dynamics code yeah, where you have like kind of von Oppenheimer molecular dynamics and uh, few switches, surface hopping uh, kind of, but, but the, this is just a fraction of these things uh we have so if we want kind of to develop a framework that can be applied to 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 quantum chemistry on a very abstract scale we kind of have to have um abstractions for these three um kind of um uh, classes i described before right and yeah, so so recently we developed, uh, uh, in the last year we developed this code framework, which I now call a bit more of the basic aims that it's kind of a toolbox for general quantum chemistry software development, basically everything outside doing electronic structure uh, uh, development. So if you want to create an optimizer or an MD code, so later I show how we build our uh, surface hopping and direct dynamics code on top of that using this framework. And if you want to read a bit more about it, the paper on that is on Chem Archive here and it's currently under uh, revision in JCTC. So it will hopefully be also available soon for you to see um okay and uh yeah uh if you write a, a code you should also always have some general aims for what what the main purpose of that is and in, in my case uh, so in, in this case we want something that is uh 
uh, that that has the the main goal to to be able to do fast prototyping and so i want really to explore different methods and uh, try new things out in a very fast and interactive way and uh, as the name already uh, suggests the the whole library is in python so python is kind of uh, a very uh, useful programming language to do these things um, you want uh, yeah just to kind of fast develop things there's a saying in, in python you can basically import everything because somebody wrote a library for so right and uh for for this fast prototyping what i want my code therefore to be it should be easy to extend right so I, it should be easy to extend new features and on top of it what i also want it to be is kind of be lightweight so i don't want to have a code that depends on or that is uh, that a library that is very large if i just want a few features in, in in the C++ community, they always say you should aim to not pay for what you not want. So you only should pay for for the things that you need. And I, I kind of try to to incorporate that because there there are a lot of good libraries outside. But if I just want a very simple parser, I don't probably don't want to download uh, several uh, a gigabyte large library to just call a single function of that because if i do that with uh, uh or if i inc uh, if i implement a lot of dependency in my code it tends to get more problematic and yeah and last but not least i want something that is friendly for the developer that's currently using it and also something that the end user kind of enjoys to use and that is not too much of a pain to do and um yeah so 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 here basically i talk mainly about the if you want to do software development so you really um you really want to implement some uh, dynamics code or whatever some optimizer i don't know um but of course i want also something that supports kind of daily tasks like a uh, typical uh, workflow in a, uh, for a computational chemist is that you set up multiple calculations you submit the calculations on a cluster and then you collect the results and then you read stuff from those results and collect oh, and create useful figures and tables that you then use to analyze on those. Um, and therefore I want kind of also a, a, um, a library that supports those things. And of course you can write these things manually before and I, did of course already in the past, but you end up to re-implementing these things over and over again. And I, I kind of want kind of a toolbox, more like here in this case, like a Lego brick toolbox, where I can simply combine things that are already written and uh, uh, I can just do, the, uh, can very easily write a workflow that does those things I want without, without really recreating the wheel all over again and again. Right, but if you do that, especially for like the, the last thing, there's something that kind of, at least for me, I don't know what about you, but for me, it's kind of annoying uh, or things I don't care so much about, but they are very important to have useful tools. And this is like how to deal with user input and also how to deal with documentation. Uh, so, so these things, like if I write a script for myself that just submits a few calculations and collects something, it might not be really on my priority list to have a very very fancy and usable user interface uh, uh, because I'm just collect uh, and I wrote the script so I know exactly what it's doing um, but uh, in a lot of cases those scripts get handed over to colleagues and so on so it, it 
it kind of is really useful if you have those things, especially if you have kind of documentation. But uh, there are also kind of issues with those things, like for example, in documentation, sometimes if your code grows, you do changes and you don't update those. So that's like a saying from, from Ron Jeffries, who's one of the uh, initiators of this extreme uh, programming uh, together with uh, Kent Bank. And he says, code never lies, Com comments sometimes do. So, 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 I, uh, so therefore uh, I try, or the, the, uh, that, that's basically the spirit of all in-code documentation and tool on that. So uh, um, yeah, uh, for, and therefore I present how you can do some of those things automatically with the framework that we are also using in, in, in PySurf. And actually we use a different library, which is also written by me, which is called Cold because for at the beginning was a command line toolbox. And uh, I'm sorry for those that are not too familiar with Python, but just bear with me uh, and follow through that uh, very simple example. So you don't have, you know, that's kind of a decorator. Uh, so, so basically I changed that function and I say, I want to have a function that I named very creatively example function that takes two inputs. One is a method which should be a string and the string could be TDFT, ADC2 or CC2. And the second one is an optional argument that is uh, kind of uh, the number of states that I want to compute and that should be an integer. And uh, that integer should be larger than one, that's what I want. And if I want, if I have such a function, I want to expose that to the user. Uh, of course, in Python, I can do that and I can create and I can parse these arguments using sysarg or the arg parser if you want or click if you know that framework. Uh, and here basic code provides you an abstraction around the arc pass. So if you write this thing, which is I hope kind of readable. So the first argument is basically the default, the second is the type and the uh, third is optional and it's kind of restraints that you put. And if you call now this function in main, for example, it produces you a, a user input that looks kind of like this. So it gives you this minus h normal help function. It tells you that method should be a string and is either of those. And it also implement uh, kind of put here also the comment, the description that you put on top. So it kind of tells your user that this is the electronic structure method you want to use. And well, the second is an integer and the number of states that you have, right. And uh, on the um, same lines, we can also do that a bit more complicated. If we have a class, then we can inherit from a base class. And then we have this magic uh, variable that, that is a class variable, which is just a string. And that's the same string basically that you have here in the uh, from command line that you passed there. And uh, additionally, you have to basically implement uh, a second function that's called from config because you kind of, uh, so, so, so that's kind of a global constructor to call the init of that system. So that's actually a class method. Um, Cold automatically converts it to that in case people are, uh, if you're not fam too familiar with Python, don't worry about that. Um, anyway, if I have that, then I could basically write this here, for example. So I could create an object of uh, my example class from the command line, and it would in fact use this command line interface. So it would give you the same thing as that function. But I can also do uh, the second one, which is from questions. So, so there I provide an input file and I basically initialize that class using an input file that looks basically like this. And again, it uses um, uh, through 
the automatic type validation. So if the user provides here as end state zero, then it will raise an exception it's already on passing and tell you that this is not possible because well the developer said it should be larger than one. And the same if somebody provides an yeah. Uh, uh, a method that is not defined. Okay, it can, of course, it has much more features, but I, this is just a look. And you will, if you use PyTurf, you will run across that syntax quite a lot because basically the whole code is based around, is built around that. And um, yeah, again, find it on. Uh, on GitHub, you can also pip install it if you want to. So in pip install it called PyCold, but the package that you import is cold. Okay, good. Back, ah, oh, yeah, finally. <laughs> uh, that was user input. Now comes user documentation. And in use uh, the documentation, uh, there's for Python the uh, Swinx automatic. Uh, uh, documentation generator. Um, I, uh, I guess basic, uh, most people have seen it, even if they don't really recognize. I show in a second an example, and then probably will recognize that because basically all Py the all documentations of modern Python uh, software is built using that, and uh, they use um, uh, a a special markdown uh, language, which is called restructured text, and that has so-called directives. And uh, we, we also provide, with, within COAL, you provide a directive for for these, um, for, for things, which is here in this example called COAL. So this uh, reads in the following manner. There is a Python module that is called Swings example, and in that, uh, Sphinx example, there is an, a class that's called example class, and please create me the coal information on that. And the same I can do is our uh, example function. And the code that you create from that looks basically like this. So this is the output if you compile those few lines. And basically it tells you here is your example class and the keyword that it needs well, the first is this method is a string and should be one of those. And this is the description that it has. The second is kind of an int and should be like that. And for the function also displays kind of how to use it. Uh, and again, the implementation. So you can very easily write your user interfaces and user documentation. And because you only have to maintain uh, basically your code. So the moment you add here something or you change something, it will automatically show up in your documentation and you have never really to worry about those things again. Okay, so that was just an excurs uh, that I think is very useful for or I hope that it uh, is very useful for some people, um, even if you just do small scripting. I think it's quite useful. And with that, I finally come to our code. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, so so Python is, is basically built around these these three abstractions I told I talked. At the beginning, so you have a sampling module which basically gives you independent structures. Then you have something that is kind of a propagator, and then you have what we call the surface point provider, which is an abstraction that gives you kind of electronic properties at a given point on your potential energy surface. That's why it's called like that. And um, yeah, so, so you have simple abstraction for those three cases. And on top of that, oh, I have things around a plugin engine. So, so, so each of those things you can customize without changing actually the core logic. You just have to write a plugin. And I'll show in a second how, that, how easy that can be done thanks to Python. And um, 
Yeah. And the last layer is basically kind of some output and we, we decided to use um, uh, basically NetCDF uh, format as an output, which is very uh, easy to read and a kind of uh, it's a portable binary format. So it's has the advantage that it can be very small and uh, yeah, uh, also easier to parse and uh, process. But well, you can on that level you can kind of change what you want. If you want ASCII output, you can also do that. It's kind of up to you, right? And the well, the last thing for that is kind of we we have in the, in a in a very early stage, we have kind of a pipeline or workflow engine where you should really do these things that I talked before that are called daily tasks. So you can simply say, I want some structures that come from some sampler and uh, I want to set up 200 calculations using those and they should be uh, QCAM calculations and I want to submit them. So it kind of should provide you with this um, uh, yeah, with, with those methods to, to really just plug things together that you will use multiple times without re without reinventing the code. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more on those three parts and the layer of that system. So the most important is, of course, we say the, the service point provider, and that's just like the abstraction to compute somehow electronic properties. And uh, of course, they are already on the market level, like the atomic simulation environment, also um, some other. Super, yeah, we, we kind of build our own. Um, uh, oh, and um, the, the thing that makes our a bit special that we have kind of an, um, integrated database on top, which well, as machine learning kind of becomes more important in, uh, in our research field, it, it kind of makes sense to, to store data in a, a transferable, easy to use uh, way. And you can then um, use those on top with some, what we call interpolators, where we have several implemented and currently Albert, our PhD student in the group, uh, who comes from the field of uh, artificial intelligence is now uh, building more models that one uh, can directly use with in the framework. So you can set up several hundred QCAM calculations and store all the output in a database and then use a, a machine learning algorithm that you implemented in terms of an interpolator plug in and uh, directly train on that data in a very easy workflow. Um, yeah. Additionally, we have some analytic models like uh, in in our paper, we use uh, some mod for privacy and just so on. But because sometimes to test and to debug, uh, uh, it's it's very useful to have analytic uh, models that are very fast to compute and they can really play around and also have the exact solution. So um, yeah, they are very useful for debugging and so on. So. We have all of that integrated and on top for, which might also be interesting for most, we have also a C, a C++ and Fortran interface. So uh, typically what you are doing, if you write Python code, you would basically call uh, to speed up your calculations a C or Fortran library. Below here, we do something kind of uh, opposite, so you can integrate, so you can link against our service point provider from C or Fortran, and then you can call the Python interpreter directly from your, um, your library code. And we use that, for example, for our Quantix, and also um, the, the uh, probably will be used for 
our Gromax interface. Um, and it, it is just very useful to do your development in Python, not have to rebuild the whole system from scratch each time you try something. Okay. And yeah, very briefly, the other is so, so the sample is kind of something that is, is just implemented as a Python iterator. So, so it just gives you a next structure till it runs out of structures or till it reaches the maximum structures you requested. And uh, there are several things that we have implemented, like a weakness. You can do it from weakness sampling. You can kind of use the normal mode sample. You can give it a Gromax uh, of initial trajectory, and it will give you snapshot, random snapshots from there, or only the fifth snap, uh, every fifth structure, or whatever you you requested. And uh, the last thing is kind of the main code. So, so all the in the or the most interesting algorithms that you will probably write are kind of in this propagator where you have like optimizer molecular dynamics schemes. And I have to be honest that here I, I still marked it kind of like that they are also plugins, but typically the propagator is kind of special. So there's uh, uh, so there are only for a few cases they can really set up a template uh, for for um, uh, a general base class that implements the uh, the logic of of those. So so it's more easy uh, typically to write those from scratch and use just the underlying so the surface point provider and the libraries that we have for output and so on to build that. But yeah, um, right, we, uh, these are the things uh, we have. And uh, yeah, now uh, kind of everything is built around these user plugins and that, that are kind of your way. If, you, if, you if the code doesn't do what you want it to do and you need a new feature, you, that's your way to do that. And the, the advantage if you have plugins is kind of you don't need to understand the full library. You just need to understand where, uh, how a mod, uh, for example, works and what function it needs. So in this case, the only function that it actually needs is uh, uh, to be implemented is get and from config, which is it's constructed from whatever user input you uh, you ask for. So in this case, I said for my model, my example model, I want that the user provides it some dimensions and some states, which should be an integer. I don't put any constraints on the integer. And then I can construct from this from config directly the object using those uh, properties in a pipeline automatically. So, so therefore it uh, it automatically uh, extends the input parser of my code uh, um, to also be able to pass the input for uh, the model and also well, it, adds, it uses those automatic documentation features. And I really have to only so, so the nice thing is that this class is kind of self-contained. So I have at the beginning kind of written, these are the things the user needs to specify to, to use my class. Then I have some way of initializing the class. Um, and then uh, I have the, 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 uh, the logic that I need. So in this case, I, I just have to have a get function that answers our request. The request is basically, give me which properties to compute are, uh, for a given structure. So request contains the molecular position and also all things that should be computed. So you are free to implement this get method in whatever way you want. The only thing is you should not lie. So if you say that your model, oh, your, your, yeah, your model can basically uh, um, un, uh, compute uh, gradients, then well, it should be able to compute gradients. Uh, the whole pipeline will break down. But yeah, 
So the only thing you have to write is this, this model, which are really self-contained. Everything that you want is kind of here. You don't have to change any parser additionally somewhere outside. If you add new keywords and so on, they get magically uh, via Python's pipe uh, constructor pipeline they get passed to to the to the constructor here and uh, you end up with a nice object of that class automatically from your input uh, by just writing basically this line um, okay and uh, this is a basic overview of these things that we currently have i i already showed you basically is the Part. So we have several ab initio interfaces, mainly uh, QCAM is used, and then we have several interpolators, whether they have like a radial basis function that you can find in SciPy and so on, very basic Shepard, and also somewhere in linear interpolator. And more interesting are kind of the, the, the neural networks, which are not in the current release, but will be added uh, soon. Uh, we have several models that you can have um, uh, in the in the next. We will also put some optimizers. We have already codes you can use, for example, from the uh, RSE, ASE, uh, from the atomic simulation environment. You can use their optimizers. You can use this surface point provider as an ASE calculator. Uh, we have several propagators currently working uh, uh, and only. Uh, so far, Lando Sena self solving. We will also add uh, Charlie, but it's also possible to basically use here any of the existing self solving codes, so like Newton X or Shark or Jade. Um, they, as we have a, a, a nice uh, interface also to uh, forge on and see, uh, you can basically build everything around those. And then we have some samplers to set up calculations, weakness and norm mode, and uh, so on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. And that, uh, after this very long introduction, me to to a bit of science. So 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 now I present basically the code, and now we come back to what we here in the group are using that for and that leads back to non-adiabatic dynamics. So 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 here, here you see the the sketch, the cover page that we used from uh, that I used also at the initial of my talk. And um yeah so so in in uh if you if you study um non-adiabatic dynamics of system typically you put your system in a starting uh, excited state. So, so assume, for example, that it was uh, excited, photo excited according uh, to its oscillator strengths and so on. And then you create a nuclear wave packet on an excited state, and you uh, uh, and you kind of see how that involves. So, in the case of of surface hopping, you would uh, basically create a ensemble of independent trajectories, and then you propagate those independently on the surface. And um, in a lot of cases, what actually happens is that the, um, that all of those trajectories, or the majority of those trajectories um, uh, kind of follow a given path. So your, your potential energy surface kind of has a uh, or has a, a priority um, a prior path uh, um, where it will kind of relax to of course you have bifurcation in the system and so on but the um, basic assumption that people put in in, uh, in direct dynamic simulations is typically that um, the um, the conformational space that you visit during your dynamics is significantly lower or smaller than the conformational space that you will um, visit uh, uh, or that you would need to uh, compute if you would do a, a pre-computed 
uh, grid approach, something like that. And this kind of illustrate here by this slide. So basically, if we want to describe the, uh, the accurately the um, the excited state dynamics of that process, we, we we have in this assumption just to compute the potential energy surface around the, the, this this slide here, and basically the majority of our dynamics will take that path. And uh, that come up, uh, or that leads basically to the idea of a uh, to, to go back and use some machine learning algorithms and kind of fit the just that needed potential energy surface and uh, do dynamics on the fitted surface without recomputing uh, um, the potential or the points. Uh, on your potential energy surface, and therefore kind of reducing the amount of computation that you can do. And uh, yeah, to illustrate that, we have here, like I said, uh, uh, analytic models are very useful if you want just to see if things conceptually work. So we use here a 5D Percy model according to Sala. And you see here a single surface hopping trajectory. So here the potential energy surface of so the ground side, first excited side, second excited side, along those. And actually there are two lines in that plot. Um, as you can see here, if you zoom to uh, very closely to that uh, point in on the uh, on the potential energy surface where you have the dash line which is your fitted surface and the solid which is the actual reference data so uh, actually if you select just a few um of course that's a model right if you just select a few um uh um or if you pre-compute in a smart way uh, a few potential uh, points on your potential energy surface, you can basically create the data, uh, you, you can propagate your system just using your fit data. And um, so we, we use uh, uh, an, a very basic um, flavor of surface hopping, which is called the Lando Sena surface hopping. And that uh, uh, which uh, is basically developed for a two-level system. And it, it has the advantage compared to Tali that it only depends on uh, potential energies and energy differences for the hopping probability. So there's no need to compute non ebatic coupling vectors instead and actually propagate um, the electronic wave function. And uh, yeah, so uh, if you use that and combine that with the uh, uh, with the ability that you have actually very accurate potentials, then you could come up with the idea that uh, you can simply uh, feed a database basically with uh, some given uh, structures and their excitation energies. And then you uh, fit the potential energy surface from there. You compute the gradient directly from the fit, either numerically or analytically using some autograd scheme. Um, and uh, yeah, and then you can basically do energy, uh, you can surface, you can do non abetic dynamics, surface hopping dynamics, where you have only performed adiabatic energy calculations and you didn't even do a single gradient uh, analytic gradient computation and you didn't uh, do a single non adiabatic coupling vector calculation and here you see again the the output of of this kind of uh, simulation for um uh for, for again the uh, the 5D uh, Pearson model, and the reference is basically Lando thin surface hopping using both energies and gradients from uh, from the from the analytic model, and 
the dotted is basically uh, is the same where you just fed a database with energy values of your model and then you computed everything else analytically from from those fitted surfaces and as you see the the dynamics is basically uh, identical so very uh, minor changes and therefore we switched and did another very small application which is this time a real molecule so not a, uh, not a model but really as the s2 molecule and uh, the nice thing of that is that uh, it uh, shows like a ultra fast uh, transition between its second and first uh, excited state and here you see basically the uh, uh, yeah, the conical intersection that you have if you plot basically the bending mode against the anti-symmetric stretching mode and yeah the as the conical intersection is very close to the random region the moment you excite to here basically you're a uh, nuclear wave packet gets funneled through the conical intersection and uh, you have uh, you get a very accurate or you get um, a very fast um, uh, population transfer between those and uh, yeah the, the potential that you see here actually are the fitted one from our data by and we use 7000 electronic structure points to fit those but you see the potentials are very smooth so and actually to confirm that we performed um, a conical intersection optimization and compare this with QCAM's uh, minimum energy crossing point optimization we basically get exactly the same result so our potentials are very accurate and therefore well, it's not so surprising that if we do again these energy only calculations and here you see the output of uh, 100 trajectories uh, so in surface hopping the time step is half a femtosecond so it means basically we did uh, 20,000 uh, qm calculation to produce the uh, solid line while uh, for the energy only we only use the 7000 data points that we had in our database so basically we uh, we we reduced already uh, the number of electronic structure calculations that we needed to perform by half and um, yeah additionally um, we now have fitted potential so we can do things like uh, uh, conical intersection optimization and basically for free and we can compute rates and we can also use the potential uh, to use instead of surface hopping um, uh, uh, something like multi-configurational uh, time dependent heart dream method to do real nuclear wave packet dynamics on those surfaces okay and uh, so so that's kind of the motivation why we use uh, this and uh, we hope that uh, also if we improve on the interpolators and so on and learn a bit more how to select or how to fill the database before the calculation so that we can really reduce the number of electronic structure calculations that we have to perform even if we go to large uh, or molecules with larger degrees of freedom and i think i'm already a bit over time so i think we go uh, basically directly to questions i guess and therefore i end that with uh, my acknowledgement especially uh, to my supervisor and uh, to johannes who sadly left us for a career outside academia but without him the whole work wouldn't be in this stage it is and um so he had a lot with the coding and the most of the implementation of the actual code i more responsible for the uh, python framework behind it 
And uh, then we have uh, Albert who will do a lot of uh, uh, machine learning now on those things and Edison and Irene who uh, have to use it for applications and see <laughs> if, uh, yeah, how it works. And therefore I thank the whole group and uh, QCAM for having me here for my nice talk and funding agency. Um, both codes that I presented you can find on my GitHub page if you're interested. And thanks a lot for um, attending. And if you have questions, feel free to ask. Uh, thank you, Max, for the inform informative talk. Very impressive work. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, questions or inquiries here. So feel free to submit a question this is in the question box. So we got the first inquiry. Uh, can we go back to the slides with, uh, um, with the reference for the PyStar? I think it's pretty, um, pretty the first two or per three. Good stop. <laughs> So that? Yeah, uh, this one. Yes. So this is the paper. Um, so let me. Uh, uh, I wonder if you can uh, copy the link, the 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 uh, the link to the paper to the question box or the chat. There is a chat. Wait. How do I switch from organizer only to everybody? Oh, sorry. Oh, really? Um, let me try to type it. I, I can I can send it to you, and then you can. <laughs> so, go okay. That could. Oh, wait. Okay. okay, I think I got it. Thanks. So I have second questions. Um, so which, what level of theory you use for the SO2 potentials? In that case, because it's just like to explore how the code conceptually works, we, we use simply uh, uh, TDDFT, um, but we also compared with the results of higher uh, um, of higher order. Uh, um, so, so some multi-reference uh, uh, CI uh, calculation that were done by the group of uh, Leticia Gonzalez before, in, I think, 2014 is the paper. And uh, well, it, uh, yeah, the results kind of agree with those. So, so therefore, we were fine. Also, for the correct or for the complete, uh, um, for the, for the complete understanding of the process, you would need to include triplets, which we kind of neglected for for the sake of simplicity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what's the dimensionality of the fitted surfaces? Uh, right. uh, in which stash? I mean, <laughs> you, you mean how, how, uh, like, uh, how, how large they, they are basically yeah. valid? Or what, what? I mean, uh, so, 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 yeah. Or what, what, what is the largest molecule that has been tested so far? Uh, the, the, the largest we currently try was, was, was basically the pyrocene full molecule, which has 10, 10 atoms, so uh, yeah, uh, around. Uh, so, so they are not really, uh, so, so the systems are not really large, but but uh, if you want, but for uh, wave packet molecular dynamics, they are kind of still 
So if we can get accurate potentials on those, we are already happy. <laughs> but of course, the, uh, if, if, uh, if the neural network kind of improves then, or the, the machine learning algorithm kind of improves, then uh, we hope that we can treat much larger systems. But that's a speculation, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I have questions. Uh, so does the Landau Zener service hopping also work for systems where more than two states come close to uh, come close in energy? Um, well, we, uh, we, I really never tried it, but conceptually it should fail. So what 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 happens? So if you have, for example, a crossing with a triplet. Uh, so, so if you have a singular triplet crossing, basically where you have, in the same case, four states involved, right? These three triplets and one singular, then uh, Lando Sena basically just uh, rises the the hopping probability depending on the energy gap. So, if the energy gap between all states are small, it, it will basically give you a hopping probability of one for for all of them in the worst case and uh that will basically uh will lead that well you will permanently hop and uh you don't have the selectivity that you have if you include stuff like the non aesthetic coupling vector and so on. um but we never tried it actually that's something we are current or we are we are wanting to explore a bit more when how far can you go with that very simple algorithm so so to to uh, uh, does it really fail in those cases or maybe it kind of works still but we are we did i cannot uh, so so conceptually it should fail but you never know right <laughs> thank you so I wonder if you have the uh, hands-on example to show how uh, PySer uh, talked to the quantum chemistry software, QChem, for example. Um, well, sure, okay, let's show. Well, uh, um, you see my screen, right? Yes. So, um, by look at the QCAM points. So, so it's a normal uh, SAS, so you basically call directly the QCAM executable. Uh, you have here basically the class you inherit from the base, uh, which kind of register it these are the sections that you can currently set on the QCAM. Um, and yeah then uh, you have the get method right where you basically say if um, this simplified version if 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 i have if i need a gradient then but compute a gradient then let's get an energy stuff like that so that's how it in principle work if you have something like the ice or something you can directly call their functions here um yeah in case that answered the question um mm -hmm. okay okay thank you um I, so there are no more questions. I'm going to move to close the webinar. Uh, if you came late or want to watch the video again, uh, it will be available on YouTube in the next few days. Um, and you may also post the questions at, the, in, at our uh, forum. And thank you again, Max, for the talk. And thank you all attendees for listening. This concludes our webinar. We would like to thank Juan Yulu for organizing, running, and moderating this webinar. We also invite you to visit us on Facebook. Thank you for your participation, and see you at the next webinar.